Robert, your new book, To Be a Man, is only just published a few months ago. What made you want to write a book about men at this, uh, at your age and at this point in evolution? Well, it's interesting because I didn't really want to write a book on <laughs> men, but I was asked to by the publisher of Sounds True if I wanted to do a book like that, and I immediately said, sure. So I dove in, and... Um, it was a long, difficult, beautiful process. There were two major edits of it. And um, by the time it was done, I thought, I can't write anymore. But I got it done. And as I wrote it, I felt happier and happier that I was doing it. Because I've worked with so many men in the last three and a half decades who were suffering in so many ways, uniquely as men. And I'd never addressed that. And here's my chance to actually address what I saw men needed to face. What, what, would you, what would be the three most important things that you'd like men reading it to actually get out of your book? Well, that it's possible to heal deeply from all the wounds men are holding and in many cases denying. A man that's not worked with his unresolved wounds is not capable of full relationship and does not live a very happy life. So there's that. Also to face and understand shame. I put that earlier in the book because shame is such a major part of a man's makeup. Most men have been shamed from an early age for not manning up, being more of a man, getting together, and have had have suffered profoundly from it. Even if they've achieved a lot, they've still been brought down by it and have been narrowed in, in many ways. I think the third thing, and I haven't thought of a list of three before with this, is this is learning the difference between anger and aggression. Very important. Most of us guys, when we get aggressive, we think we're just being angry. We haven't realized we've actually morphed from healthy anger, which is a vulnerable emotion, to something that's basically an attack. However nicely it may be smiling, it's an attack. I guess there's a fourth thing I have to put in here, because the last third of the book is mostly about sexuality. For men to develop a, a, a f um, healthier sense of themselves sexually, so they're not expecting sex to create connection for them, and they learn to release sex from the obligation to make them feel better or more secure or more of a man. And in that, there's an outgrowing of pornography. Not a shunning of it or suppressing of it, but an outgrowing of it. So they become capable of being fully present in relationship, which I think many women are crying out for. And men are aching for that too, but often they don't see what's holding them back. Their sexuality not being fully healthy, shame that's not been worked on, unhealed wounds that are being left unhealed. Yeah. yeah. You, you talk about true masculine power as a dynamic blend of soft and hard attributes. So can you talk a little bit more about that? We all know that the macho male is very hard, yeah. he's appealing to certain types of women, he's a guy, he's tough. Then there's the soft male who's very sweet, he's sensitive, he's passive, but for lack of a better term, he lacks balls. He's mm -hmm. cut off from his guts. So he's, a, he's safe in a sense to be with, but he's not fully there. But a man who's only hard is cut off from his heart. A man who's too soft is cut off from his power. So I see my book as an invitation to men to connect head, heart, guts in full-blooded alignment. I say full-blooded because it's a passionate affair. It's not some quiet little bit of therapy you do in a corner. This is about coming fully alive as a man in a responsible way. So a man like that has passion, he has force, he has drive, but he also has tenderness. And I think men are capable of this. My book is an invitation to consider stepping into a manhood that's like that. It's not some ideal. I've seen men do it. It's there. And it's such a liberating thing for a man to feel his power, his raw power, and also to feel caring without a diminishing in that power. Absolutely. And that is what women are looking for so much in their men too. And a man does that, a man becomes safe to a woman. He can really protect, be fierce, but he also can open and be tender. And, it, and they work together. The synergy of that is remarkable. So you talk about shame and you've mentioned that again. Um, shame and self-inflation. Can you talk a little bit more about Well, shame tends to deflate us. Yeah. Whether it's healthy shame or unhealthy shame, it, does, it deflates us, it shrink wraps us, and part of the solution, the unskillful solution to that for many of us men is to go into pride, an unhealthy pride. And that pride overinflates us, pumps us up, and we get overly caught up in anger. Because anger can make us feel inflated, like the torso swells, there's more blood flow to the arms. 
and but it's not necessarily healthy. And the answer, of course, isn't to deflate, is to find a natural sense of expansion, which happens when the heart's brought in. Because when, we, when we're in shame, our heart is shut down. If I work with my shame skillfully, it's as if I bring the shame to me into my heart. And there's a healing then. Do you feel that most men actually are aware of the shame they, they're carrying? No. I, may, I think maybe superficially, but not deeply enough. And shame because they don't notice it because so often shame morphs very quickly into other states. So if I'm unconscious in that way and I feel some shame with you, I might get aggressive very quickly toward you or toward others. Or I may shut down, stonewall, withdraw, dissociate, disappear. Those are unskillful solutions to shame. But when they're happening, it's as if there's no shame. There's just withdrawal or there's aggression. So for a man to understand shame, he has to slow down in his work, take a deep look at the shame and stay with it, and to identify when did this emotion first show up in his life, how was it mishandled, and even more to the point, what kind of relationship does he have to his inner critic? Because the inner critic is the voice of internalized, toxic self-shaming. And we all have an inner critic, but not many of us relate to it skillfully. And a person driven by their inner critic doesn't function very well. Do you feel shame plays a larger part in men's lives than, life than women? Yes. Yeah. I think it plays a big part in women's lives, but I think for men, there's even more of a pressure to be something that's not so natural to them. Little girls, little girls get to be a certain way. Little boys are often pressured to be little men. And, and, to, and to treat their vulnerable emotions, their tender side, as somehow uh, is a problem. So they learn to pathologize it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't be a wuss. An insult for a guy on a football team might be, hey, look, to be called a lady or a girl. Yeah, and it goes on and on. What, what about vulnerability? Uh, how does this fit in? Hugely. I mean, vulnerability, without it, we can't really be in relationship to any depth. And for a lot of men, vulnerability means kind of collapsing, uh, the hands go to the face, oh my God, look what's happening to me, it's so embarrassing. But when we can stand tall in our vulnerability and feel some dignity in it, we become, again, a safer place for others, male or female. Because we're, the more vulnerable I am, the more in touch I am with my, my, all my feelings and different motivations, I see myself more clearly. There's more space. But of course, like many men, I grew up armored. And when you're armored, your vision gets very narrow. And my armor had to be cracked through some extremely painful relationship issues when I was in my 20s, breakups. It cracked my heart open and I could feel again. I could cry deeply. I didn't cry at all as an adolescent. I was just hard, athletic, lifting weights. I was a tough guy. You know, all of that, that had to go. That armor had to crack. And yet I still had to have boundaries. And when I see men get past the shame they have about coming for therapy or group work or men's work, there's so much grief. I mean, they cry just as hard as any woman. They cry their guts out. It's so painful. And what a relief to be able to cry, not be looked down upon like somehow you're, you're, you're girlish or you're wrong or you're wussy. You don't, you're not a man. A real man can cry. And he also can take strong stands. So you, you mentioned too when you, uh, this morning, and you've also said in your book, you make a distinction between anger and aggression. Mm. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yes, anger is a, a natural emotion. It's a vulnerable emotion. Um, aggression is what happens when anger loses its heart completely. It loses all caring for the other and it becomes an attack. And unfortunately, anger and aggression get conflated in our culture and also in a lot of spiritual literature. Anger and aggression and ill will are all translated by the same word in a lot of Buddhist texts, for example. So I've taken great pains to separate anger and aggression. And for men and women, we need to know the difference. Here's anger. It's not an unwholesome state or a bad emotion like many people say. It's not blocking our love. Aggression is the problem, and aggression is not an emotion. Aggression is something we are doing with an emotion. When we turn anger into hostility, we're doing something with anger. Ill will, hostility, aggression. So that distinction is really crucial to, to see in one's own life and in others deeply. Yeah, so that's anger without heart. Yes, real anger may not have much heart, but there's always some connection to caring. 
So, so one is not going to do damage through healthy anger. You can be angry, you can be fiery, loud voiced. Uh, it may not look very loving, but there's some degree of, of connection to the other still there. Once it becomes aggression, the other becomes someone just to treat badly, put down, disrespect. We can then bring in some disgust, turn it into contempt. We can really go down a very dark path once we've turned anger into aggression. So being at your edge and being challenged is an important part of being a man. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, because the challenge brings out the best in a man. If it's healthy challenge, it's not, you're not pushing a man too hard, but you're still giving him a push. And courage doesn't mean you're not scared. It actually means you're scared and you go ahead anyways. And challenge can bring out a man's courage. When that happens, what I call the warrior in a man can emerge, the healthy warrior who can take, who can go to battle, can protect what's vulnerable and soft in him and others, but he hasn't become a savage. He's not a killing machine. He's still a man. He's just as angry. Mm -hmm. And the challenge can bring that out. And of course, implicit in that is you're at your edge. When a man finds out what his edge is, maybe it's to speak a certain way, behave a certain way, and it's scary for him. When he starts to approach that edge, it brings out the warrior. It's like he's approaching the dragon's cave, step by conscious step, but he's moving in that direction. And any man that's doing that deserves applause, I think. You also talk in your book about power and uh, how a man uses it as being very important mm -hmm. to him. Uh, you may actually make the statement that much of a man's work is to reclaim the vitality and primal power of his wildness without adopting its viewpoint or letting it direct things. Can you talk more about that, what you meant there? Yeah, because if I'm simply lost in sort of a, a wildness of, of passion and which manifests as anger, I could be um, unskillful, I could hurt others because I'm, I'm, I'm taking on the viewpoint too of that. So if I have some, say, dark aspect of me surfaces that's from my shadow land, so to speak, I want to divest it of its viewpoint, which could be very, very narrow and want to hurt or attack. But I don't want to rob it of its energy. I want that energy for me. I want that mm -hmm. power to be with me, but I have a responsibility for seeing it with a clear, conscious, loving eye so I can take good care. When that happens, then I would not be drawn to overpower another. I'd be more drawn to empowering and being in a relationship where I can share power, in relationships where I can share power. Because my investment in being the powerful one is not then running the show. Yeah. So having courage and being a hero is also very important to man. Um, can you talk more about why that's so important? Well, I think the hero is, is the quintessential beauty and depth of a man. And, and when a man touches that place in himself, I think it, it's, it's like, the, here's the warrior again, mm -hmm. in a heroic mode. There's something very ennobling about it. Yeah. If a man handles it well, it doesn't go to his head, make him inflated. It's just like, here he's showing up. And heroism cannot look like heroism. It could just be going up and going to work each day because it makes it possible for his children to eat. There's something about ordinary, everyday heroism that's so important. Mm -hmm. And it's also useful to identify who our heroes were when we were little. Whether mine was like Tarzan when I was a little boy, I was just swinging the vines, beat my skinny little <laughs> chest, and and to identify that and to look at who do we look up to now, who do we, who are our models now, and is that how healthy is that? Where am I pulled? It's a good thing to consider. That's why I have a chapter on the hero in the book. So what about in relationship, Robert? What are what do you feel are the most important things a man must remember when he's in an intimate relationship? His heart and his power and to be attuned to the other, mm -hmm. to not be so caught up in his own self, he doesn't see the other. Because many women have complained to us in work that the partner doesn't spend much time, he doesn't see them, isn't very interested. And, and that sense of extending beyond oneself to include the other is so important. So when a man's healthy that way, he doesn't fuse with the other partner, he expands his boundaries to include the, the, the other. So he maintains his autonomy, but he's also included the other. And that takes a certain strength, takes a capacity for boundaries, capacity to be angry, to keep those boundaries in place. And it's also this desire, men, men want to be, have an intimate relationship, but most men don't want to put as much into it as is needed. Okay. So they need to wake up to the fact, you gotta put something into this. If you're getting defensive left, right, and center, and, you're not, and, and she's putting up with it, 
you need to do something about that and not just allow that to stay in place just because your partner is afraid to perhaps challenge you in that. You need to grow past your old patterns. You need to see through them. So a man that's really going for it in a relationship is going to be working on himself therapeutically, spiritually, in all sorts of ways and will learn to enjoy it if he gets into it fully. Without that, we men can complain and complain about the women not being not doing the right right by us, but we're not showing up. Now, the women have work to do too, but a man that's not showing up, in the best sense of that phrase, is not going to have fulfilling relationships. Yes, and more and more these days, that's what what uh, we're ex- or women are expecting and wanting, mm-hmm. aren't they? Yep. Yep. There's a huge opportunity here for both mm-hmm. sexes to go to a much deeper level through uh, mutually transparent, awakened connecting. So there's work for women in that, there's work for men, and the rewards are immeasurable. You talk about deep communication in your book. What do you mean by that? I mean communication is not just focused on the content. It's also focused on the context, and it also listens to what's not being said. It's aware of body language. It's aware of different layers, different layers of depth. It means attuning to the other so profoundly you get them. It's not, we don't have a better phrase in English for that. We used to use the word grok in the 70s, 60s and 70s, but you really, you resonate with that person in a profound way because you're listening. You're not filled with your own response. When you're listening, you're empty in your mind, you're spacious in your heart, you're just there present and your response is not preformed. It arises organically according to what that person is saying and how they're saying it. When that happens, any of us, or in the presence of that, we almost always feel good. Like it feels good to be listened to. Absolutely. It really does, yeah. deeply. Yeah. There's many women, well, there's, there's, there's many men, men, women and men who will complain that their partner doesn't listen to them. So the empathic listening and attuning. Yes, and also implicit in this is listening to yourself. So if I'm working with someone in a therapeutic context, I'm paying very close attention to myself, even though I'm listening to them with all my attention. I'm aware of my breathing, shifts in me, intuitions arising, choices I'm making. So there's, there's a, an ongoing sense of being very present to the situation, the other, myself, the relational field. And we're, it sounds complex, but we're quite capable of this. When it comes to sex, what's your main message to men? Make the shift from expecting sex to create connection to letting connection be the priority and letting sex arise as a natural, organic result of that connection already being in place. In other words, do the work that makes connection possible. And then sex will flow out of it in a way that does not do harm. Another way of putting this in a way is to say, release your sexuality from the obligation to make you feel better, more secure, or more manly. Don't pressure sex with that. Don't expect sex to do so much for you. And also, learn what it means to eroticize your wounds. Look at the old patterns you have that were not sexual when they arose, but were not. But the wounding was left. You had a charge with the situations, and you eroticized that as you got older, and you projected onto men and women, and you're acting out old wounding through your sexuality. That needs to be seen through. Once it's seen through, it's a revelation for most people. Oh my God. Most of us have done that in spades. See through it and choose not to go there. Choose not to let your wounding drive your sexuality. Work on your wounding. Let your sexuality be instead an expression of a connection that you naturally feel with another. It's very different. Yeah, absolutely. What about uh, your views on porn, pornography? I think it's an epidemic and it's so sad to me that it's so available and there's so many people who are teenage boys flung into it and everything's available from the most soft stuff to the most gross, disgusting aspects. It's all there. It's all available. And there's a kind of a liberal mentality that we should just, it's just porn. Let's be tolerant. Let's be sex positive. So I may sound like I'm aligned with people that I'm actually far from aligned with and, and saying no to it. But my no is not that of saying, let's get rid of it. It's more, let's, man, let's outgrow it. Let's look at it. Because if I'm caught up in porn, then whatever woman I'm with, I'm in a triangle with. There's me, her, and the pornographic fantasy that has me hooked. And women I know from a lot of experience working with them do not like having pornographic stuff projected onto them during sex. Some put up with it, but they're not, the man's not with them. He's actually 
screwing a fantasy that's projected onto her. And it can be outgrown, but to outgrow it, we have to face the wounding that first drove us into attaching to it. We have to see through it. We also have to see the dehumanizing aspects of it. Once a man has really seen that, it's very hard for him to continue. He sees that the women he's looking at, by, for the most part, are probably very damaged, may look happy, but they're really suffering, and the debasing, degrading aspects of it, if a man's turned on by that, he needs to do some deep work. If you're turned on by violence, being implanted in the sexuality, do some work on it. So my call is kind of hard in this section of the book, but I'm calling to men, wake up, and the reward is that women are going to have far deeper bonds with you. Far deeper if you've worked this through. Not being a good guy who's got a secret pornographic corner in his mind, but a man who actually can give us 100% attention to the woman he's with, and there's no pornography, it's not allowed into that arena. Now, if you have that habit, and I've worked with many men on this, the key is to turn toward it, work with it, and there's steps to do it I've outlined in the book. It's, it does work, and it takes courage, and it will bring out the warrior in you if you do it. But do it for the sake of all of us, not just women, all of us. You, you talk about taking charge of your charge as well. You have a whole chapter on that. Can you just share yeah. a bit of Many of us men have... We may feel a, a, a momentary flicker of charge with a woman, mm -hmm. but we so easily will let that manifest into full-blown fantasy, and we act like we can't help it. My point is, it's a choice. Our sexual arousal may not be a choice, but what we do with it is a choice. Many of us act like we can't help it. She does this to me. She makes me hard. She does this and that. We tend to, in a certain unconscious way, blame women for our arousal, and it's very dangerous territory. So it's all about becoming more awakened. It's like mm -hmm. deep sexuality is conscious. There's a wakefulness. It's not just hormones and friction. There's an awareness too. And what I'm, this chapter is all about developing that awareness and deepening it. At, at the end of your book, Robert, you say that the passage to full manhood is a quality quest. Can you share what you mean by that? Well, oh, I, I just like the term quality quest. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a, we open to something so profound in ourselves by taking the journey to full manhood that it's not just for deepening of relationship. It just feels really good to us at the soul level to, to do this. Then we awaken to what we really are as a man and even beyond. So it's a quest and we're reaching for a higher quality. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I hope that... Uh, Every man in the world actually reads your book. I actually feel that that's the, the, of, of the best book ever written on um, manhood uh, and developing the full qualities. And I'm glad I gave it my very best. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.